Okay, so I wandered a little bit from the purview, and I'm sorry, this looked a lot better on my screen. Um, so this says, an anarchist, feminist, post-human digital archaeology. I've been told I need to come up with a different name. Um, I'm very interested in how digital archaeology can help defeat empire. And so following Bergman and Mon Montgomery, I use empire to name the organized destruction under which we all live. And this is my knowledge map about how I attempt to do digital archaeology under empire. And it is deeply imperfect, and I look forward to discussing it more with you all. Um, I'm not as interested in cataloging what we know in the way that I think that was intended by this session, as, but in asking how we can weaponize digital archaeology to fight fascism. And you can see my uh, machine kills fascists. I just like this sticker. I thought it was cool. Um, structural inequality and capitalism, and if we can use it to incite joy and transformative creativity. I'm ecstatic that so many of the sessions today and people have actually highlighted this in their research, but today and other days, um, archaeological data for modern problems and digital archaeology of modern conflict landscapes, particularly Patricia Martin Rodia's work on the disappeared of Sao Paulo, absolutely powerful, absolutely vital. And um, also Eric Champion mentioned his PhD student, Rusalia Baslamid, who explores modern design activism to reconstruct historic landscapes of Palestine and constructs, constructs them or contrasts them with the modern security checkpoints that litter the landscape today. So um, I think hopefully um, I am humbled by all these really strong, really rigorous interventions and I can hope to only add a little bit to this discussion. Um, I've heard a lot about in these um, presentations about egalitarianism, sort of synesthetic political interpretation and how people from the past and present, or sorry, um, egalitarianism, cooperation and public outreach, but it's missing some vocabulary that would actualize the research and make it more discernible to activists, students and stakeholders who have all been asking us to find better paths. So here's my knowledge map that you can't read. Um, so cyborg archaeology, let's start on the top left. And um, unfortunately, I made the dire mistake of pointing in the eulogism in my latest publication to uh, describe embodied synesthetic political interpretation and how people from the past and present can come together in a digital interstitial space. I look at craft versus efficiency. And so this is Carraher's slow punk archaeology of care and Eddie Dennis's work on how the efficiencies of digital archaeology can actually make space for analog archaeology. And that's the most compelling uh, argument I've heard so far for trying to make your workflow more efficient. Um, and De Tourment, um, which I have discussed before as a surprise intervention, trying to make you understand archaeology and heritage and past in a different way. Um, I think this was kind of used by Paola di Giuseppe, Giuseppe, I thought I was going to get it, Giuseppe Antonio di Franco, and she cited this as the uncanny. And so, unfortunately, there's a heavy um, subversion versus incorporation for detourment, um, because often these subversions are then taken and then sold back to us as sort of semi-political statements um, that are easily digested. And I look at Braidotti and Haraway, post-humanism, how to explore digital and political ways to think, feel, and make kin. Affective interpretation, the famous Sarah Perry's enchantment model versus the neoliberal dreadnought of contract archaeology in stretching that last pound, euro, dollar, swati, breaking your workers and making digital archaeology a handmaiden in this endeavor which Nicholas Sorzen actually speaks really brilliantly to in um, his chapter in Archaeology and Neoliberalism. Um, so I'm really interested also in upright up rediscovery. Um, there's been a lot made of multivocality in archaeology, and I argue that we need alternative narratives in scholarship, not multivocality, because multivocality leads to sort of a liberal both sidedism. I'm going to get some feedback on this one. A superficial inclusion is ghettoization and pandering and actually speaks to Marcuse's concept of repressive, intol of repressive tolerance 
So um, some recent research I've been doing is notes that the archaeological canon is broken, deeply broken, and needs to be loaded, probably replaced, actually. Um, I'm looking at Spinoza as well. I'm looking at um, adopting questions and not necessarily codes. For Spinoza, the whole point of life is to become capable of new things with others. His name for this process is joy. And so I'm citing again Bergman and Montgomery's Spinoza's ethics speak to evoking this joy. And sadly, we have the um, cor uh, capitalist realism down there as well. And that is coined by Mark Fisher, small red book, different red book, but I highly recommend going and reading it. It's online, free. Uh, capitalism seamlessly occupies the horizons of the, think of the thinkable. It pervades our archaeological interpretation. And you can see this in many of our archaeological interpretations, like world systems theory, some other things, where we have purposely tried to make these narratives, these linear narratives that ended us, the state, the most amazing people ever. We need to rethink that quite a bit. And this leads us a bit to the Black Trial Collective. And that is a group of anarchist archaeologists looking to expand the realm of the possible. So we're looking at different horizons, different timelines, how do we expand and contract and make actually meaning out of the past that we can build better futures. And I think pseudo archaeology, I did have a sneaky peek at Lorna's, which I think she'll talk about much more cogently than I will, but I will cite Meg Conkey and Tringham, uh, Ruth Tringham in that the media has fostered patriarchal, essentialist, authoritative thinking and this must be fought with hammer and tongs on every single level possible. Finally, um, I find a lot of inspiration in Joyful Militancy. Again, it's free online. Look it up, read it, it's great. By Carla Bergman and Nick Montgomery. So, Joyful Militancy is a feeling of power to change one's life and circumstances, and it's at the core of collective resistance, insurrections, and the construction of alternatives to life um, under empire. So this is opposed to a sort of rigid radicalism, which is just has a stranglehold on most social media at the moment. Um, the impulse to be the most radical, the most anti-oppressive, to have the most correct speech and be the most militant. Um, this performative thing that keeps on happening, policing each other, is, is a bit difficult. Um, and so this has become apparent in paranoid reading, which is also a form of policing. Um, a, a penchant and radical thought for the constant critique based on a stance of suspicion. It seeks to ward off bad surprises because most people offering these critiques have been hurt before and hurt profoundly. And this can be understand, uh, it's understandable why they are trying so hard to protect themselves and others. But then you're always on guard and you're never surprised. So I'm a digital archaeologist because I find it transformative and creative. And so I want to just ask, how, the how then can we bring this transformative, creative power to help think our way out of capitalist realism? Thank you very much. <laughs>